Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. As you flip through a hymn book, you will see the names of Isaac Watts, Fanny Crosby, John Newton, and the name of Philip Bliss, among others. Today, we're going to talk about Philip Bliss. Actually, I'm going to let a biography published shortly after Philip Bliss's death do the talking about this man and his process for writing hymns. But first, in case you are unfamiliar with Philip Bliss, allow me to tell you a little bit about him. Philip Paul Bliss was born in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, July 9, 1838, in the usual log home occupied by the early settlers of the mountain and forest region of northern Pennsylvania. Philip's family moved from place to place during his early years, so he had few advantages in the way of schooling growing up. Yet he early developed a passion for music, and would sit and listen with delight to his father singing, and early on would sing with him. He would readily catch up a tune and whistle it, or play it upon some musical instrument of his own manufacture. Philip Bliss tells how when he was ten years old he heard the piano being played for the first time. It happened that as he was passing a house, he heard music, sweeter than anything he had ever heard before. The door stood open, and he was drawn towards the sounds that came from within. He was barefoot, and entered unobserved and stood at the parlor door, listening entranced as a young lady played upon the piano. As she ceased playing, he exclaimed with intense delight, "'Oh, lady, play some more!' She looked around, surprised, and with no appreciation for the tender heart that had been so touched by her music, said, "'Get out of here with your great feet!' and he went away crushed, but with the memory of harmonies that seemed to him like heaven. Music was just a part of Philip Bliss, and from the years 1864 to 1876, just twelve short years, his pen was busy giving expression to the songs that came to his mind. All of his work was done during these years. He was twenty-six years old when he wrote his first song, and thirty-eight when he wrote his last. Philip Bliss, like Ira Sankey, joined D.L. Moody in evangelistic meetings across the country but not without a little encouragement first. During the winter of 1873 to 1874, Mr. Bliss received many letters from Mr. Moody, then in Scotland, urging him to give up his business, drop everything, and sing the gospel. Mr. and Mrs. Bliss were ready for this, if they could see it as the Lord's will. Mrs. Bliss's characteristic remark was, I am willing that Mr. Bliss should do anything that we can be sure is the Lord's will, and I can trust the Lord to provide for us but I don't want him to take such a step simply on Mr. Moody's will. There are seven books of songs by Philip Bliss. Five were sold to his own, and two were done in connection with others. His five were called The Charm, The Song Tree, The Sunshine, The Joy, and Gospel Songs. He designed them with different purposes in mind. The Song Tree was a collection of parlor and concert music. The Sunshine was designed for Sunday schools the joy for conventions and for church choir music, and gospel songs for gospel meetings and Sunday schools. From 1870 to 1876, just six years, his pen was very busy. Including the above books, he also wrote 40 or 50 songs in sheet form, many pieces and books of others in exchange for what they had furnished him, with much miscellaneous writing as contributor to a musical journal and in other directions and all this in connection with his convention, choir, and Sunday school work up to 1874. And from that time, constantly in evangelistic work, make us marvel that he found time to do so much. It can only be explained by an admission of his wonderful gifts that made his songwriting not so much a matter of labor as a delight, an outflow of melody that must find expression and a careful and laborious training of fit methods of expression of words and harmony for the melody with which his soul was filled. He was a very systematic and orderly man in all his surroundings, scrupulously neat in person and apparel, and shrinking from all suggestion of vulgarity in anything in him or around him, his study or place of work, wherever he might be, partook of the nature of the man. His books and papers were in order, his desk or table usually clear, and his work prosecuted in a business-like manner. It pained him to have things in a helter-skelter way about him. A misspelled word in a letter, or the wrong pronunciation of a word in an address, was to him like a note out of harmony and music. His penmanship was very neat, and his letters and manuscripts, as completed by him, are without blots. 
he never liked to write a letter with a pencil, and would always copy over a piece of music if possible, rather than send it to publishers with, with erasures. And yet none of his friends will remember him as being one known as a precise man, in a manner to make others feel uncomfortable in his company. His joyous nature and happy and good-humored way of noticing others' defects and of carrying out his rules kept away any uncomfortable feelings on the part of anyone associated or brought in contact with him. His tenderness was such that he would not have injured the feelings of a child for worlds. Mr. Bliss's best songs were never studied themes connected with the Sunday school lessons of those days. They were studied pieces, and he often said were not a success. They did not have inspiration in them. He could not sit down at any time and upon a given theme write a given song that would be a success. Sometimes the melody would come to him, and he would work it out and write it down and wait for words. Sometimes the line of a chorus would be the first suggestion of a hymn. Sometimes the last verse of a hymn would form in his mind and would be written down, and hymn and tune be worked up from it. More often the whole hymn in theme, structure of words, chorus, and tune would begin at once and all written out together. This, he has said, was true of the hymns that had been most sung. Hold the fort. Down life's dark veil we wander. More to follow. Jesus loves me. Windows open towards Jerusalem were written in this manner. His own soul was full and thrilled with the themes that took possession of him. My most vivid recollections of him will always be of his entire self-abandonment of joy and the consciousness of being used of God and bringing out in song some precious gospel truth, some exalting view of Christ. He has come to me often with the theme of a hymn and with his face shining and eyes moist, explaining his plan and purpose, as in his mind, and asked me to thank God and pray with him that God might bless the song. He never felt that the songs originated with him. They seemed to him to come through him from God. As he grew in the knowledge of God's word, he would marvel at the truth he had expressed in his songs without knowing it. At the time of writing Hold the Fort, he had no clear views as to the testimony of the scriptures, that the attitude of the Christian should always be the daily expectation and desire of the personal return of Jesus Christ. When this truth came in power into his soul, he recognized the purpose of God in his writing the hymn, and that its use by the church all around the world was on account of its harmony with the word of God, upon a truth intended to arouse Christians. Mr. Bliss's experience crystallized more and more into an apprehension of a personal Savior, Christ risen, Christ ever present with us, Jesus, the real, living, personal Jesus of the Gospels, came closer and closer to him. His communion with Christ was uninterrupted, and his songs in those days abounded with Christ. The last year of his life, nearly all the songs he wrote contain the three themes of Gospel testimony. Christ died for our sins. He lives for our justification. He is coming again in a glory which we are to share. He did not plan these hymns with any purpose to teach these truths, and was surprised himself when his attention was called to the fact of the uniformity of their testimony in these directions. He simply wrote of what filled his own heart and had come to his own soul. The half was never told. No other name is given. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Are your windows open towards Jerusalem? Hallelujah, he has risen. At the fate of Jesus. Hallelujah, tis done. All of which appear in the Gospel hymns number two are example of the truth of this statement. It is also very suggestive to notice the character of teaching, in words furnished by other authors with music written by him, that appear in the same work. I am sure that he did not contemplate any tests of this kind in making his selections from scores of manuscript songs that were monthly sent to him. He simply sent music to the words that inspired music in his soul. I do not think he ever exchanged a word with anyone as to any distinctive character of teachings in the songs selected. But all these words that he selected convey the same leading truths. Look away to Jesus, hold fast till I come, out of the ark, till he come, it is well with my soul, etc. are examples. Mr. Bliss's songs can only be understood and appreciated by an understanding of the reality to him of the truth they convey as connected with a personal Christ. The words he sang so grandly, Jesus Christ is my all in all, my comfort and my love, my life below and his shall be, my joy and crown above just filled his soul. I believe he had no more thought in singing them of doing anything for the entertainment of people or to excite admiration than the meadow lark mounting to heaven singing as it soars. He sang from an overflowing heart to the praise of a Savior. The last words that I know of his writing were the two pieces, My Redeemer, and I've passed the cross of Calvary. Nothing that he ever wrote made him more happy. I can see him now as he came into my room at Peoria and stood by my table with the words of the latter piece written in pencil 
and I can hear his earnest voice as he read the verses and called my attention to the empty tomb and the vantage ground. And the tears filled his eyes as he stood there for a moment and spoke of the risen Christ, the acceptance we have in him, and the victory over sin and over the flesh that faith in such acceptance gives a believer. Now, he said, if the Lord would give me a tune for this, I believe it will be used to bring some souls to the mountain. Thousands of people who never saw Mr. Bliss feel that they knew and loved him through his hymns. To them and to the generation to come, the principal interest in his life will center around those productions of his pen. Sadly for us, Philip Bliss's life ended when he was but 38 years old. He and his wife were traveling by train to Chicago when the terrible accident at Ash Tabula caused the train to go off, the, the bridge collapsed, the, the train went off the tracks into the water, and Philip Bliss and his wife were among those who did not survive the train accident. It has been speculated for, for a time that his children also were with him, but thankfully we know that was not the case, that his two or three boys were still back at home. But Philip Bliss, his music, and it, not only his music, he, he's written the songs for many, many, many uh, famous hymn writers, but the words that he himself has written to go along with his, his own music are, is amazing. Hold the Fort is a powerful song. There's a, there's a good story behind that, that song as to why he wrote it, and we'll talk about that in another podcast. We'll try to do a whole podcast one day about just the stories behind some of... Um, Maybe some of just the famous songs, or popular songs. Maybe specifically Philip Bliss. We'll see. But definitely something more to talk about, about why some of the hymns were written by him, the music that he wrote for It Is Well With My Soul. The story behind why that song was written and how Philip Bliss was included in or writing the music for that song. It's a very interesting story. This is just a little bit about Philip Bliss. There's, there's a lot more. I... Trying to decide what to talk about, I realized I just wanted to center a little bit about him and, and his music itself, why he wrote what he did, how he wrote, and taking an excerpt from the book Memoirs of Philip Bliss just seemed like the easiest way to do that. Uh, it's written by someone who's very close to him, who worked with him. Good, clear way to explain how others saw in that day and age, not uh, speculating many years later, but from someone who was very intimately connected with him, who saw songs before they were even published, who got to interact with Philip Bliss in that way. Just seemed like a good way to help us learn more about this man. If you've not heard his song, Hold the Fort, the music that he wrote for It Is Well With My Soul, make sure you go listen to that. It's beautiful music that he wrote. Not not like the music of today, but still. But that's just a little bit about Philip Bliss. We're going to do another podcast probably uh, in the next week, maybe two weeks, uh, on what happened to Philip Bliss, the, the, the accident that happened, and then some of the story behind the, te the testimony people gave about Philip Bliss's life following his tragic death. So that will be coming up in a future episode. So hopefully you will listen to that. But thank you for listening to the God's Peculiar People podcast. We will talk to you again next week. <laughs>